Hey guys, quick update from the podcast. Our next audio documentary series is going live Monday, August 30th. It's called Slaying Satyev. It's a story about the biggest upset in wrestling history. We put a ton of time into these audio documentaries. Our last one was The Smiths. Slaying Satyev is coming August 30th. It would mean the world to us if you checked out all four episodes on Monday, August 30th, right here on this platform. I really don't have a lot of pressure on myself. I mean, we have a shirt. It's pressure is a privilege. So, I mean, you know, I like having pressure on myself. I like putting pressure on myself because I expect myself to do good. I expect myself to win. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time I spent wrestling, if it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is Ryan Warner, your host. The Olympics are over. It was an amazing run for Team USA. We're going to have a recap episode come out later this week, but in the meantime... Let's get you to Austin Gomez, who is our guest today. Austin was a three-time Illinois State champ, two-time Fargo champ, wrestled collegiately at Iowa State, where he was a round of 12 guy as a redshirt freshman. And then Austin retired from wrestling due to concussion-related injuries, but he's back now. He's going to be wrestling at Wisconsin this year. Loved having Austin on the show, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Fan of the week goes to my man Donnie Allen, that's DC Allen 11 on the gram, a fierce wrestling fan, a national champion boat racer, hailing from the Badger State, Wisconsin. Donnie, thank you so much for the support. It was great sharing a few messages with you throughout the Olympics. As always, ladies and gentlemen, Wrestling Changed My Life is proudly sponsored by Spartan Combat, who just announced the dates for their 2022 Spartan Combat Nationals. That'll be happening in Florida, Jacksonville, Florida again, April 8th through the 10th, 2022. More details to follow, folks. And that's it. Let's give it up for the great Austin Gomez. Welcome to the show, my friend. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on. Yes, sir. Illinois legend here on the show. It's an honor. This is a big Chicago podcast, so I remember seeing you for a long time, as well as your family in the in the circuits for a long time. We're going to talk about all of that, but let's get to the present, man. You um, recently announced your re-retirement from wrestling. What went into that decision? How that all come about? Um, you know, when I first made a decision, I thought I was making the right decision. But, um, you know, before I even made that decision, I guess I kind of like didn't kind of like fell out of love with wrestling um I didn't really like it anymore I didn't enjoy it just because I think I was just cutting just so much weight that you know I was just tired of it but you know as I was just sitting out at Iowa State and like watching the team you know do their thing do an awesome job and then you know I'd start uh working out again and stuff like that and I'm like dang I know I can do this again and, you know, I want to. So I sat down with on a Zoom with a concussion doctor out in Pittsburgh that I go and see and, um, you know, just had a good conversation with him. And, you know, if he didn't clear me, then I wouldn't have came back. And so, I mean, yeah, it all started right there. Just wanted to make my decision to come back, you know, because I love wrestling. I love the sport and, you know, I'm ready to go full force into this thing again. 
So how early on were you, were you falling out of love with it? Like 2019, when you had that breakout year, did it start then? No, 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 no. Um, just, I mean, right when I got my last concussion, really, it's just like, why does this keep happening to me? You know, I'm doing the right things. Um, I'm training hard, you know, just maybe I was just training too hard, maybe. And, but yeah, I mean, once I had got that concussion, I was like, why, why does this keep happening to me? Mm. Um, I couldn't understand why. And, you know, I was having a hard time trying to cope with things. So, um, you know, I thought that was kind of just like the way out, I guess, because, but down the road, you know, I, I love wrestling. So it's, it's, it's yeah. hard to pull me away from it. You know, I'm always thinking about it and always just thinking about wrestling, trying to get better every single day. So, so when, uh, I guess just so folks who, who don't know, who are listening, um, how long were you out? Was it out? Was it a full year and a half or just the, like a half a season? Um, so the year that I missed, I was out, I think it was a 2020 season. And I got hit, and I think that's like early October, um, right before our cyclone open, I think it was. And um, like week before, I got hit then, and then I didn't step back onto a mat when I went to go see the doctor. He told me to sit out the whole year. Take, wow. He, yeah, he told me to sit out the whole year and like just take a break from it, you know, just to heal properly and just making sure we're on the right track so but I didn't step back on a mat until February of 2021 so or over a 2020 over no a 2020 no 2020 so it happened in 2019 sat out 2020 and that's when COVID happened gotcha. that's when COVID happened so you told me to sit out the whole year you know that stung but um it was the right decision I mean me and Kevin Dresser were joking about it, right? Um, when the NCAAs got canceled, and he was like, gave me like a nudge, and he said, I guess it's kind of a good year to get hurt, wasn't it? So, and then we both started laughing, but um, you know, it's tough because I wanted to wrestle and yeah. not being able to wrestle stung. So, was it like a, a particular duel meet that you can remember or a tournament you watched where you just kind of had a conversation with yourself and decided that you had to get back in the mix of it? Um, I mean, just being in the practice room every day, watching those guys, you know, I was kind of like a little like assistant, I guess, when I was in the room because I could still go in there and I guess just like help the guys out and be there for the guys, you know, so I still want to be there for those guys to help push them to reach their goals of being a national champion, all American and, you know, helping those guys get ready. So, I mean, seeing those grind, those guys grind every day, it was hard. Um, you know, I was like, dang, you know, I want to come back. I want to, I was thinking to myself for a long time, but I didn't tell anybody. I was How just long? thinking like to a myself. couple months or like a couple weeks. Uh, I would say about like a month or two. And then I finally got up the nerve to tell my dad that, Hey, like, I want to make a run at this again. And he said, all right. And you know, that's so when I told him that he is pretty pumped because obviously he's pretty bummed out when I made the decision to retire. He's like, all right. Um, and I, I knew that I was going to transfer right away. Um, I, so he's like, all right, you know, I'll try and figure this stuff out for you and stuff like that. So my dad was big help during this whole like decision to come back into wrestling and stuff like that. What was his response when he told him the first time that you were stepping away? Um, you know, it's, it's very emotional. Um, like I didn't want to tell my parents, but I told them that, uh, Christmas Eve dinner table, um, my whole family was there and you know, it was very emotional. I mean, I was crying. My mom was, my sisters were crying. My mom, my dad, you know, wow. it's just cause I started wrestling when I was four years old and for the Ville Lombard Cougars. So it's like, um, it's something I've grown up doing, you know, I've been around the sports. I've been born. My dad was a coach growing up and he wrestled and stuff like that. So, I mean, they said I came out, came out and I had a headgear and wrestling went on. So it's hard to make that decision because it's all I've known and it's all I've been, I guess, pretty good at. So, you know, it was emotional, but you know, we got over it. So you had known since like November, early December that 
the concussion doctor said not to wrestle that year. And then you had taken it a step further and said, it's just time for you to step away permanently at that time. Yeah. I mean, right when I get hit, I knew like we all kind of like saw the writing on the wall. Yeah. You know, um, I want to be done. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, but you know, as time went on, it's just like, I want to come back. But yeah, I mean, we saw the writing on the wall. Um, and, you know, I talked to our athletic trainer, the coaches, you know, they all totally understood and what I was going through. So, I mean, it's a tough time, but um, I felt at the time it that was something that needed to be done. And I love that you've had the perspective of stepping away from the sport. So like for that time away, you couldn't identify as a wrestler as much anymore because you, know, you went out there competing like you wanted to be. And so, you know, you have that perspective of what life's like without wrestling and now you're back, which is awesome. What, like, what's the biggest thing you learned like while you were away or just the biggest thing that jumped out to you that you didn't think you'd realize? Um, you know, just like, you know, watching practice, you know, like how much of a grind, you know, wrestling is like when you're in there, you're kind of just like, dang, like I can feel like I can go forever. Like, you know, I just want to grind, 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 but like sitting back and watching these guys like wrestle that hard every day. It's like, dang, maybe we like, we shouldn't be wrestling this hard every day. You know, like maybe we should be sparring more and stuff like that. Cause you know, that's when more injury injuries happen when you're grinding every day, I guess, going hard, wrestling live a lot. And, but other than that, I mean, just, you know, there's so much more to life than wrestling and, you know, just understanding that when I was gone, like I didn't go in the room for a little while, just to step away from it really. And um, just to get away from it and clear my head and, you know, then come back. But I mean, just, it's so hard to explain because like you understand, like, I guess like a little bit more positions technique, like as you're like, I was in coaching mode. So I was in like, all right, now what can we do here to get better in this position and just figuring out little things, trying to help these guys out, stuff like that. Man, I, I love, uh, I love hearing about that kind of stuff. Cause it's like, you have a second life and, and now you're back. Uh, you're, you're at Wisconsin now, which I want to ask you how you got there. But before that you came out of high school as one of the top dogs across the land, highly recruited, could have gone anywhere. Who were your schools and how did you end up at Iowa state? Like, who were you looking at? Yeah. So the schools I was looking at, um, early on, I took on officials to, uh, Oklahoma state, uh, Michigan and, I kind of took it on official Northwestern as well, but I mean, I was looking at, you know, I got right when like I was a junior. So right when those coaches could call you, I mean, that day was crazy because I was getting calls from Penn state, you know, Illinois, Ohio state, Michigan. Um, I mean, literally everywhere. really that Northern, day. Yeah. Arizona state was calling me. I mean, Missouri called me, Iowa state called me. No Hawkeyes? Yeah. I'm not hearing the Hawkeyes in there. I don't understand. No, I, I didn't get a call. No, I did not get called from Iowa. What? Nope, never get, yeah, well, but. I think if your style is, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a goer like that, man. So, and obviously there's a, there's a pipeline of Flimbard North going to Iowa. So no Hawkeye calls. When you got the, like, obviously before that day happened, maybe you already knew where you were going to go. Um, is that the case or were you still undecided at that point? No, I was undecided. I had um, really no idea where I was going to go. I mean, I, I, I mean, I had a little bit of idea. I mean, I took an unofficial Michigan and I'm really close with the Murphy family mm. and they had quite a few Illinois guys on the team at the time. You know, I had Brian Murphy, George Fisher, Ernest Battaglia, and guys like that on that team at the time. And, you know, I grew up watching Brian Russell. So he's a good family friend of mine. And then yeah. Sean Bormet being the coach there. I mean, running the overtime, I've been going, went to overtime when I was like seven or eight years old. So, and then Bormet and my dad actually wrestled together in high school. So, you know, I've known Bormet for a really long time and I took it unofficially there. I was like, there's no way I don't go to Michigan. Like, yeah, I know a lot of people here, you know, I'm really close with Bormet, but the facilities are insane guess, there, bro. Yeah. Yeah. The Bahana center is crazy. Oh it's, my God. And it's such a fun college town too, you know, like game yeah. day Saturdays are insane there. I mean, not that, not that's yeah, why you're going, really but, fun. um, so when you just, when you got down to it, obviously you went Iowa state, who was, if it wasn't Iowa state, who would it have been 
at that time, like when you were in high school? I think it would have been Michigan. Yeah. Yeah. So when I committed to Iowa State, you know, I think I was like, we had that really good recruiting class. It was when I first committed, then I think it was Caden Store committed, Ian Parker committed, Sam Colbray, Gannon Gremmel. Um, who else committed? McLear committed, Anthony Mantonona committed. You know, we had so many good guys like committed after I committed. So like for clear was going to, yeah, for clearing was going to Iowa state. Yeah. Is this under the KJ realm or was dressed for the coach? Oh, so you went to wrestle for KJ initially. Yeah. I went to wrestle for KJ and the Polson brothers. Wow. I didn't realize that. Okay. And then, yeah. So, I mean, I, so why did, why did you decide to stay after, uh, after the coaching change, what well, that I guess that was probably a big inflection point for you as well, right? Yeah. So when I first decided to go to Iowa State, I mean, I fell in love with the campus right away. I mean, it's close close enough to home. I mean, it's four and a half hours away from where I'm at in Chicago, so it's good distance away from home where my parents would come and see me wrestle. You know, I'm a big family guy. I want my parents to be there for every duel if they can. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I've known Angel Escobedo since I've been a baby too. I mean, I've seen him wrestle in Indiana, just all over the country. He's been a big name. And then I told myself I always wanted to wrestle for an Olympic gold medalist. I wanted my head coach to be an Olympic gold medalist because he's been there. Mm -hmm. You know, he knows what it takes to get to that next level. So that was one reason why I committed to Iowa State under KJ. And then when uh, they stepped down or I got, guess got fired or really, um, you know, I was like, all right then like I don't want to stick around anymore you know I want to I don't want to wait for the new head coach I want to find somewhere else you know I was here at the time there were 56 in the country finishing at NCAAs with like a yeah. point so they weren't doing too hot but um Jamie Pollard the AD at Iowa State he said um I'm not going to release you until you meet who I have coming in as a new head coach so when he told me that I was like dang he must be bringing in somebody pretty good and then when it got announced that Kevin Dresser was the head coach, the new head coach coming in, I was like, all right, like I know a little bit about him just because of what he did at Virginia Tech when he first got there and where they're they were at at the time. It's like these guys have made a pretty big jump. You know, he's a good coach. Um, I mean, what made me stay is, I mean, one week after my state tournament finished, he flew out to my house and gave me a house visit. He's like, told me the plan with the program, you know, he didn't, couldn't tell me who he was bringing in coaching wise, like who her assistants were going to be, but he told me there were going to be some pretty big dogs. So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to take your word for it. And, you know, we're going to do this thing. And then a couple of weeks later, it gets announced that Zadig, St. John and Metcalf are all coming on staff. So I was like, I made the right choice in staying. Dude, that's insane. I forgot all those guys were there at Zadik at first too. And I've heard Dresser is one of the best salesmen of all time. Like, is it true? Like when he comes in the living room, like he's just like the most likable guy in the world. Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he is. Yep. He's it. People give him the CEO title, but I mean, he's a, he's a really good guy. He's, he's a salesman. Yeah. But I mean, he's a great guy. You know, I like him a lot. I mean, there's no bad blood when I was leaving and stuff like that, you know? I have all the respect in the world for Kevin Dresser and what he's done with this pro- program at Iowa State. So that's awesome. Like you, man, I, I didn't really know a lot about him. I kind of heard, you know, f- you know, Virginia Tech and all that stuff. But I had uh, Tony Roby on the show and did a lot of research on him. And obviously, he was with uh, Dresser. And like, man, he was like the godfather of uh, Virginia, man. Like they could not believe he left. Like he owned land everywhere. He was a legend from the high school days. And then he had taken Virginia Tech. So for him to leave was like just stunning for a lot of like Virginia diehards. And obviously it's great for Iowa State that he's there. And, um, you know, one of the top programs all time. So, so you were there, you had that taste. How did you come upon Wisconsin? Um, you know, when I'm, made a decision um to transfer I kind of like people like really don't know kind of like the story like I'm it, I kind of get like a lot of like backlash from the Iowa State people community like Iowa State wrestling fans yeah they're like oh like I can't believe like you left you're a traitor and stuff like that but truth be told it's I had no choice but to leave because our athletic trainer and our doctor wouldn't clear me to wrestle 
Oh, really? At Iowa State. Yeah. So they said, we understand that they said, we understand, like, we understand why you want to wrestle again. Like, we support it. It's just we can't support it here at Iowa State because they couldn't, like, live with themselves if something bad were to happen to me. Got it. And stuff like that. So I had um, no choice but to transfer, but I think um, I would have transferred anyways. I mean, I love Iowa State. You know, I love the town of Ames. It's a great town. Um, I love all the coaches, all my teammates that were at Iowa State, you know, all my best friends and brothers. But I think it was just time for a change of scenery. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been in Ames for f- four years, and um, I just wanted to change it up and get a new taste. I mean, so – I was going to leave anyways, but Wisconsin, I mean, when I decided to first transfer, John Reeder was messaging me on Instagram, like five minutes later, like when I got announced on transfer portal, he hit, hit me up on Instagram right away. And then so there, he texted me every day, like asked me how I was doing, you know, no how way. he's going. that how's on it. Dude, he was on it. He was like, how's, how's training going? How are you doing? Um, how's your head and stuff like that. And he would text me every day, even when I wasn't committed there. He's like, champ, national champ, champ. text me national champ every single day. So when you got guys like that, that text me like that every single day, it's like, how do I not want to go there and wrestle for those guys? You know, if they believe that I can be a national champ, you know, then I believe I'm going to be a national champ under them. But, I mean, Wisconsin's Madison's awesome town, awesome yeah. city. You know, it's an hour and a half away from home. So I can't, you can't beat it. Um, I kind of go home whenever I want and see my family. Bro, um, especially you grew up in big 10 country. We got to get you back in the big 10. Like it's good to have you yeah, back right? in there. You know I mean? Yeah. We grew up in the thick of big 10 country. It's like, dude, it's just so the big 10 tournament's held in such high esteem around here. You know, it's like so cool. You'll be back in it. Yeah. I mean, Growing up, I always wanted to wrestle in the Big Ten. I mean, that's what everybody wants to do. Every kid who's getting recruited and pretty good coming out of high school, I mean, they want to wrestle in the Big Ten if they can because that's where all the tough wrestling is. And it's, it's like the Big Ten tournament's like a mini NCAA tournament. It's like if you place pretty high at the Big Tens or place the Big Tens, you potentially could be a national champ or All-American. So, I mean, it's good testing grounds. Well, in I mean, the Big Ten then, Network, it's like the most – there's so much yeah. wrestling on TV now. You know, you're going to be yep. everywhere – and uh, it's just so exciting that, and I, and by the way, I love Reader and Bono. I mean, I didn't know them at all until I started this show, had them on right away. They were just like so exciting and the, the energy they put off. I know you know this by now, but mm-hmm. it, it just makes you feel good, you know? And so they were telling me like their morning routine and how crazy they are. And we were talking a little bit off air. They just got done running a hundred mile race. And, and you were telling me that these guys are getting up at like 3 a.m. before they work out with you guys. Yeah, they would get up at like 3, 4 a.m. just to get in there how many miles they had a day. So they started off pretty slow, and it was like they'd crank out like 10 miles, 12 miles, and they'd pick it up almost every single week. And I would text and be like, hey, I'm on my way up to Madison for wrestling practice just because I haven't, I don't have a place out there yet. And be like, all right, we're just getting our run. We're finishing up like 20-something miles. I'm like, you guys are freaking insane. Like, but I mean, they, they put their minds to it, man. And they did it. It's, it's kind of hard not to get behind those guys. You know, if your coaches are doing it, you know, it makes me as an athlete and kind of us as a team, like, Hey, why can't we go the extra step or go the extra mile while we're wrestling practice? You know, if our coaches are willing to go through pain, that means uh, we should be willing to go through pain for those guys as well. So, I mean, it's, it's super cool to see. I mean, super motivating. You're like, dude, like I want to go on a run now, not a hundred miles, but you know, I'll go for a run now. Um, and to but, see, yeah. uh, to see those guys lumping across the finish line, you just know they were in some pain and they got it done still like crazy to see. Yeah. They're yeah. They were in some pain. They were walking like they were hurting bad. Hurting. I'm, we're going to get reader. On, I was going to say, we going to get reader on the show. I was, I messaged him. I'm like, did you finish? He's like, had to, um, but he's like, I'm hurting so bad now. I can't even do a podcast, but we're going to do it like this week or next and, and talk about the adventure of the hundred miles. Cause it's like yeah. crazy. Yeah. They're probably in bed, freaking legs up chilling right now. That's what I would be doing. They're probably sleeping and relaxed. Oh. I mean, their bodies are probably broken down. I mean, it's going to take a while 
for them to recover. So no doubt. And like, I also was just thinking, obviously you have Seth Gross as your weight. That's going to be a great workout partner. Um, so have you officially moved to Wisconsin and you're all settled in? Uh, I move in in two weeks from today. So I'm moving on August 16th. I'll nice. have my own place up there. So, you know, I'm excited about this new journey and this new home that I have. And, you know, I'm super excited for my future and what, what my goals are and to watch me achieve those goals. So it's going to be fun, man. And for, you know, for people who aren't from Illinois, they know you anyway, up from a national scale, but for Illinoisans, man, the Gomez family has been on the scene for quite some time. Give us a little rundown. Is it your grandpa or your, your dad and your uncle who kind of got things going? So, uh, my dad, uh, my grandpa never wrestled, but my dad wrestled for, uh, West Chicago high school, uh, in high school. Um, you know, he's, he's wrestled 98 pounds a senior year. So he is a little guy, but he's not 98 pounds anymore. <laughs> so, um, he was 98 pounds. I think the best he did in state was like fifth, took fifth place cause he missed weight. So he had to go up a weight class <laughs> and he's, so he always tells you that story and like how if he didn't miss weight, he probably would have won it. Cause the guy, he, uh, beat the week before won that state tournament, that state bracket, the weight below him that he missed weight at. Wow. Cause I guess if you miss weight, you could just move up to the next weight class. Crazy. I didn't even think you could do that. That's crazy. Yeah. So he took fifth and then, you know, he went to Germany a couple of times, wrestled internationally, but never really stuck to it. Kind of just wanted to start working. Mm -hmm. um, and then he started coaching at the Villa Lombard Cougars. So he started doing that with under Jim Considine. And um, what about Joe? You know, though? Is Joe his, his yeah. brother or is that your no, uncle? Or? Joe is my cousin. Got it. Okay. Okay. So yeah, Joe is my cousin. He wrestled that, you know, we kind of, my parents took him in. Uh, that was my dad's dad's uh, nephew. Gotcha. So, so he lived with you essentially for yeah, a long time. Live with us. Yeah. Live with us ever since I was growing up. He lived with me. So, really? So how much yeah. older is he than you? I wouldn't say he's like 30, 15 years, 16 years, maybe. I want to say that. Okay. So quite sure. a bit though. So yeah, he's quite a bit. So what, when, when he, he was came wrestling up, high school, I was like three, four years old. So I was like, just start wrestling. So you don't even really have any memories of him going through it. No, not really. None. Yeah. Cause he, none. I mean, he was touted as one of the best high school wrestlers ever. I mean, he, did he win three, four? How many? He didn't he win four. Two. He won two. He won two. Cause he wrestled he Lavender. Two. Um, did he beat Lavender or did Lavender beat him? From Lavender. Bowling. I think he beat Lavender. He did. Yeah. I remember seeing those bracket boards. You know, I'd wake up in the morning and I'd be in high school or even like middle school. Um, we, we'd have a state bracket boards like in our basement. My room's in the basement. I'd, if I'd have to go upstairs, you know, I'd have to look at those bracket boards. So, so who like, were his big every day? And what happened to him um, in those years? Freshman. He won it his freshman year. Sophomore year, he lost the guy he beat his freshman year. I can't remember his name. Okay. And then junior year, he lost to Cassio Perro. Oh, wow. And then he finally won it again his senior year. Gotcha. Okay. So. Yeah, he had like, like, I don't know if it was like 200 wins, but obviously one of the most dominant wrestlers of his time. His, yeah, he was 195 and five in high school. Wow. Dominant. Yeah. So was he your trainer growing up or who, who got you going? Um, my dad did, you know, I mean, growing up watching Joe wrestle, it's like, you know, how do I not wrestle? I mean, he's one of the, at the time he was one of the best recruits coming out of high school in that 2004 class. Mm -hmm. So it's like, all right, seeing him wrestle every day and, you know, growing up in the Glenbar North wrestling room, you know, how do you not wrestle? It's one of the best programs in the state right now. And it's always been a top program in the state of Illinois and sometimes even the country I remember when Joe was coming out, of, I think it was Joe's senior year. They won the first class tournament and they beat Apple Valley when they were ranked first in the country. So wow. I think their senior year, 
Joe's senior year, they finished number one in the country, Bumbar North did. So, I mean, growing up under that, and then, you know, the legendary Mark Hahn, how do you not want to wrestle for that guy? So, right. I mean, wrestling's in my blood, and, you know, it's something I wanted to do. It's my parents never forced it on me. You know, it's just I always put a headgear on and a singlet, and, you know, I used to wrestle this little Chucky doll growing up in our living room. And that's awesome. I, I, I wanted to wrestle. So, I mean. So, once you were into it like that, I got to imagine the training you were doing at a young age was rigorous. Like when you were in middle school in the IKWF days, were you working out five days a week? Were you doing two a days? And what was your routine at that point? Yeah. So um, after you know, um, my dad ended up opening his own club called Gomez Wrestling Academy. Mm-hmm. And our facility was five minutes, not even two minutes away from our house. It was like a mile away. So I was working out. I mean, once a day growing up, I mean, my dad, you know, is notorious for shooting, you know, you got to shoot to win. That's my dad's, you know, he calls himself the shot back, you know, it's hilarious. <laughs> does he really? Yeah, he does. Um, so big takedown cut, Instagram, takedown cut. Yeah. I mean, his Instagram thing is a shy town shot back. Love it. So that's what he calls himself. I mean, but just doing the simple, like knee over toe, you know, change your level shoot, you know, you shooting on a wall and, he was big on the Adam takedown machine. The one that just stands mm-hmm. on, sits there on the wall. I freaking hated that thing. I like, so it would have like a spring in the back of it. I would shoot doubles and like purposely try to rip the spring off the back. So I didn't have to shoot on it anymore. And wow. he'd have to order a new spring. And that would take a couple of weeks to come in. Cause I hated shooting on a thing, but I mean, yeah, my dad was just big on, you know, sh- take down, cut them, take down, cut them, take down, cut them. And growing up, people like hated to watch me wrestle because that's all I do. I wouldn't do anything on top. I would just take that, take it down and let you up, take mm-hmm. it down and let you up. So at a young age, I mean, I was just taking guys down and letting them up. And, you know, at the end, I'll put a half in and pin them. But, and were those practices yeah, my, that just like balls of the wall at Gomez? Because, I mean, because I heard you guys went hard in there. Yeah, we went pretty hard. I mean, they go pretty hard. I mean, those we had some really good guys in that room and you know my dad that's the only thing he knew was working hard you know you're not going to get by by not working hard so he's like you know we're gonna run you guys down and we're gonna you but and work hard but he didn't push he pushed you but if you didn't want to do it you didn't want to do it so Mm -hmm. all the the guys were behind him everybody was behind him we believed in his philosophy and believed what he was doing with us that, you know, it's going to work and it's going to pay off. And, you know, for some of us, it did. And, you know, we did really good things for my dad in that club. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I remember the the club and, and seeing you guys warm up and I, I vividly remember you, man, just at the tournaments, mean mugging as like a little eighth grader, just all, all business. Who were some of your IKWF nemesis back in the day? Do you have any barn burners? Um, also Connor. Me and that kid. You guys wrestled. Tell me about it. He wrestled all the time. All the time. Ever since growing up, like when we first started, we were like five years old at the Band of State Championships in Illinois. (laughs) We wrestled. When he wrestled. We we were growing up. We saw each other every single weekend and we wrestled a lot. Was it pretty even or did someone get the better of one at one time? I don't. I don't really remember, but you know, we just batted on he beat me, I beat him. It was like back and forth we change every single week but i wrestled him a lot um what about i can't be christian robertson a lot in the finals did you guys ever wrestle oh no we never wrestled we were always different weights we stopped wrestling and right when we hit like fifth and sixth grade that's we stopped wrestling just because we were different weights he started getting a little bit bigger than me gotcha and then we finally wrestled again in high school where our freshman years he pinned me because i was trying to go for like um a cow catcher or something like that. And then he put me to my back and pinned me at, at the Dvorak at, tournament. Oh, at Dvorak. Dvorak tournament. Wow. Yep. So how many IKWF titles did you win in total? Two. I won one at six, Nava 62. I beat Dylan Duncan. The next year I lost to Christian Robertson. Um, the year after that, I won again, and then I lost to Dylan Duncan my last year. Wow. 
Bro, for yeah. someone of your caliber to lose as an eighth grader is not very common. Um, and But obviously, uh, Dylan Duncan's super on the level. So was that something that really drove you all throughout high school, that eighth grade year? Yeah. I mean, my dad, you know, he held me back. So that was like my last, I was actually in like seventh grade when I was supposed to be going to eighth grade, but I was in seventh grade at the time. So he held me back. But he's Gotcha. Like, okay. So I wasn't going to high school right away, but he said, I don't want you wrestling the IKWF season because there's no point to wrestle. Oh, really? So you held back yes. and didn't wrestle the IKWF season? Yeah, I didn't wrestle the IKWF season. So did you just go like Tulsa and that kind of thing? or what? I went to Tulsa. Yep, I went to Tulsa. I did all that, and I mainly just trained freestyle. I was just really? wrestling freestyle all the time. I was getting ready to go like try and make a cadet world team. And you did do try that, to do right? those things. I did that going into high school. Yep. I made the world team. So, gotcha. you know, that getting held back and like just working on freestyle and stuff like that. And it helped me to achieve those summer goals. And I made the cadet world team and went to Serbia that year. That's pretty amazing. I didn't realize that was the story behind it, that you had held back and didn't go out kid up yet. That's awesome. Yeah. Your dad, so I, yeah, I'm a year older than everybody else in my grade. So. Right. Pretty common in Illinois, and I'm sure most states, um, if not mm -hmm. definitely common in Illinois for, for kids to do that. Um, and then obviously you went to the great Glenbard North, Gold Dot Nation, um, just a huge tradition. And I don't know if there's any program where the alum really just stick that pride out there more than Glenbard North. Um, you know, Tony Ramos is from there for folks who aren't from Illinois, just a, a tremendous tradition. And did you guys have, were you guys battling like Oak Park? Like who was the dominant team when you were in high school besides you guys? Us, Oak Park, uh, Sandberg, Carl Sandberg, and Lockport were starting to get really good as well. Was Montini so was super like, good too? Montini, they were 2A when I was, when I was going through high school, then they finally went up to 3A, like my gotcha. senior year or something like that. So who were you guys battling at like the team section to get down there? Or did you guys win it when you were there? I, I, I don't know. Never won it. I went to uh, team state once in high school. Is that it? I only went once. Those teams only were went so once. good. Yeah, they were really good. I mean, my freshman year, it was uh, – we had Kirk Johansson at 106, me at 113, a kid named Pat Augustine, who was really tough. Um at 120, you know, we had a kid named John Marmalejo who mm -hmm. wrestled for my dad growing up. Jared Cortez. Uh, oh, you know, my we just had, God, I forgot he went to Glenbard North. Yep. And then we had, like, just so many good guys that came from, like, the Ville Lombard Cougar area, like that area, that they weren't big names, but we were just really solid up and down the lineup. Yeah. And we lost our team sectional to Conant by oh, one wow. point. Yeah, so we didn't go down to the state my freshman year. And then my sophomore year, we were really good. Uh, I think we were top 12 in the country my sophomore year. And we ended up taking third at state because we lost to Sandberg, Carl Sandberg in the um, semifinals down at state. But we beat them in the duel prior. So Was that just a packed house duel meet? Yeah, it was packed. I mean, we wrestled at Sandberg. You know, is no my sophomore year we wrestled like Lombard North, so it happened on like a Saturday, so people could come and watch. You know, it wasn't bothering like basketball or football or anything like that. So right, we just brought them in on a Saturday morning at like 10 a.m. and we wrestled. And it was packed. That's awesome, man. I I just love these uh these big dual meets. And you know, last season we were obviously robbed of them, so I'm so excited that we're gonna get some of these back this year. What was the year you were wrestling Renteria in the finals and were losing and had to come back? It was so crazy. I mean, what year we was wrestled that? that sec, uh, 20. You know, like freshman year, sophomore year, sophomore year, 2015, sophomore year. So I so took third my freshman year and then sophomore year, we wrestled at the sectional. It was at Glombard North and we wrestled on like the close mat to like the bleachers. So every, like, I think the, the videos on YouTube of our sectional match and it's crowded, but I lost in like, like triple overtime or something like that. I lost in. And then we wrestled again in the state finals. I mean, I was down, I was losing. I was like, he yeah, got called for stall. And so I was only losing by one. So I was like, all right, so I'm gonna try and push for another stall call. And then, you know, I'm pushing up her body, pushing up her body. 
and I just said, frick it, screw it. I'm going to send it. And, you know, luckily it paid off. And then there's like five seconds left on the clock. So we had to get a restart because we went out of bounds and he hits a Granby roll. But he's basically out. Like he's out for one. If he gets one, he ties the match. We're going to overtime. But luckily I like throw him, but like I ankle pick him and grab his ankle and just hang on for dear life. Like two seconds left. And it is, wow. it's is like a big like surprise because, you know, the state of Illinois is either you want Renteria to win or want me to win. And then it was like a big thing when I finally won because, you know, I was following, trying to follow Joe's legacy. You know, I wanted to be him. And I wanted to get more than two state titles. You know, I wanted to get more. And then, so when I finally won it my sophomore year, it was like kind of like a big relief off my back. It was like, dang, I finally did it. I finally got one. So. I can just imagine how crazy my man Mike Powell must have been going during that match, knowing that he was uh, at Oak Park and and just how in, in, into the matches he got. And, God, I got to go back and watch that one. I can't wait. Yeah, it was, it was nuts. I mean, he wasn't even in the corner. He was in the side, like, by the tunnel. And, yeah. you know, he's calling in for locked hands with, like, two seconds left. And – Joe was in my corner at the time, and he was just like, get out of here, get out of here. It was nuts. It was nuts oh, everybody wanted locked hands called, but I didn't even lock my hands. Like, I just had, like, both ankles hooked in like this, and my head was in the middle. Was, I'm like, dude, I'm not letting you go. God, dude, that – I can just imagine the drama that unfolded in the bleachers afterwards. Like, that's, just, yeah. that's just good old Illinois drama right there, man. Um, yeah, it's huge Coaches drama. yelling at coaches. I love that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So uh, – Man, that is awesome. And so you you said it was a big relief. So did you, were you someone who carried a lot of pressure on yourself to get that done? Or were you more of like a wide open type guy? I mean, I really don't have a lot of pressure on myself. I mean, we have a shirt. It's pressure is a privilege. So, I mean, you know, I like having pressure on myself. I like putting pressure on myself because I expect myself to do good. I expect myself to win. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, going out, you know, going out and getting that state title is like, it's kind of a big relief because you know, it's something I've been chasing my whole life was winning an IHSA state title. You know, it's something if you're in Illinois, that's what you want to do. And, you know, doing that my sophomore year is kind of like I can breathe and I can finally like relax a little bit. But I mean, I like having pressure on myself. It's, it's a good thing to have. Like yeah. you want to be like, you want to be that last match. You want the duel to come down to you, you know, you, you want to be down by, one with 10 seconds to go you know you don't want that but it's like if you know you got to do it you got to do it you're not going to freak out and you know you have a plan of attack and how you're going to attack that situation absolutely no it's and that shows in your wrestling let let me wind down with this the fargo stuff you won two fargo freestyle titles and then two greco titles right yep did you double up in those years or were those in like opposite years when those all happened i doubled up in one of them uh, my first year at Fargo, I won Greco, took second in freestyle. And then year after that, I doubled uh, Kaden Gefeller in the free st- finals wow. of freestyle. Dang. And yep, is so that Oklahoma? Am I yep. thinking? Okay. Oklahoma gotcha. Kid. Yep. Okay. What about the yep, second but, year then? Um, I won Greco and won freestyle. So I doubled up and I actually won Cadet Greco Wrestler of the Year that year. Wow. Yeah. But that year, like, I didn't even want to wrestle Greco. Like I didn't do cadet duels for Greco. I only did freestyle because I didn't, I didn't wrestle Greco almost the whole year. Cause I, I didn't want to make weight three times at Fargo. You know, I, right. And I didn't, I really don't like Greco that much. I mean, the hand fight and stuff like that, you know, I just want to shoot to the legs and, but um, Brian Medlin talked me into it and going Greco <laughs> and yeah. Coach Eric Wetzel did our Greco coach at the time. And Jimmy Chase was our Greco coach at Gomez too. At the time, they all, respect. Yep. Yep. They all talked me into it. And I was like, all right, well, if I'm doing it, this is, this is my last year. I'm not doing it again. But like, all right, that's fine. And luckily I did it and, um, took it down. I went, took it down. Yeah. Right. How did and your, then, uh, how'd your like cadet team on always do? Did you guys win it? Yeah. yeah we killed everybody. We killed everybody. Yeah. Love it. No one at that time, we had, our teams were just so deep. I mean, Guys like Grenaria, Magical, O'Connor, myself, Jacob Warner, uh, Louis Hayes, Larry Early. I mean, 
there's the list goes on and on. And Isaiah I White, can't even name it. Isaiah White, exactly. Kamal god. Bay. I Ooh. mean, <laughs> my god, dude. We, we like literally like kids on those teams. Like we couldn't lose. It's like Illinois when that, that team was put together. It's like there's no reason why we should lose. What about there's the no junior years? Same thing. I mean, junior years. Like we had those teams, but then Oklahoma started getting really good. You know, they had Dayton Fix, Katie DeFeller, Boo Llewellyn, oh, no. uh, Tristan Moran. I mean, they had all those guys. So when I went to junior duels, we took second that year and we went, we lost to Oklahoma. Dang. Good. Good to see some, some good battles out there though. And then you're in Fargo, you, you won it. Um, I'm assuming once as a junior. Yep. So I, t- after the year I doubled up, I took fifth in freestyle. I lost to Jack Mueller in the semis and then I lost to Ian Parker my future teammate um, in the county semis and then took fifth next year. I ended up winning it. And that was the last year I went to Fargo. Gotcha. And then, I was going into college. I was getting ready for my senior year. And then I decided to not do it. Bro. So the amount of matches you had on your body going into college was probably as much as anyone in your class. I mean, I, I mean, all those guys are wrestling all the time. So you were well seasoned and mm-hmm. your 2019 season at Iowa state was so much fun to watch round of 12. Was it Philippi in the wrestlebacks you wrestled or was that in the championship round? I wrestled, uh, Mc Philippi, uh, second round. That came down to the wire. That, that could have been on... some stall calls several times in that match, bro. Don't even get me. Sorry. I was in on a leg with like 20 seconds left. You know, he takes a bad shot. I re-attack him. Been out of the leg with 20 seconds left. You know, coach always tell us, we're edge of the mat, bring him to the center. You have a better chance at finishing. But with me, I'm like, I'm gonna think, if I win this, I'm going to the quarter. So I'm like, I got to finish. I got to finish. Just didn't bring him to the middle center of the mat. And, you know, I tried to finish on the edge. And him, he's really long. You know, he's hard to score on. He beat guys like Dayton Fix that year. And, yeah. you know, I couldn't finish and then lost to that match and then lost to DeSanto in the oh, round of 12. Brutal weight, bro. But I mean, that was only your freshman year. And I know you said you cut a lot. So I'm nervous to ask, are you going 41 or are you going back 33? <laughs> I'm going 41. Thank it's, God. I, I'm going 141. Thank God. Cause I, you know, yeah. I was also thinking about, you know, all the Joe Rogan podcasts I've heard where they're talking about how much worse concussions get when you're cutting weight and your like brains mm-hmm. dehydrated. So I got to think there's something there if you were cutting that hard. Yeah. So, um, you know, that, that's, we believe and the doctor believes that's, that's why one of the reasons I was getting hit in the head so hard or yeah. not getting hit, but getting concussions was because, you know, I was dehydrated. I was cutting to 133 and, you know, 133 was a big cut for me at, after my How bad? Uh, 2019 How bad? season. I mean, when I first came to college, I was weighing like 150. So, you know, I was 17 pounds, you know, I was pretty big already. And then after my 20, wasn't hard to make. I mean, I would get down, like I'd do a weight cut and get down to like 130. Mm-hmm. So I'd be like three pounds under and have to eat up to 133. But, you know, after my 2019 season, um, I was lifting a lot and, you know, just eating because, you know, they didn't want me doing any freestyle that season or that off season. And so I was weighing as much as like 160, 165. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I, was, I was big. And then, like, coach put me on the scale one day. It's, it's like, all right, well, it looks like we need to start getting your weight down. I was like, yeah, we should probably start doing that. And then, you know, it was just hard for me. I'd hit, like, once I'd hit, like, 145, like, 143, 145, I was like, dang, I still got, like, 12 more pounds to go. That was a mile and, marker. 145 was, like, you're getting somewhere, and you were going to 133. Like, that's so far yeah, away still. I was like, you know, we're getting it like it's coming down, but it's like, I'm starting to feel like crap. Like I'm, wow. I'm really starting to feel it. And then, but I think the lowest I ever got after that 2019 season was like 139. That's the last time I saw like the one thirties. Wow. It was like the lowest I got. So you could wrestle 149 and be a little small for the weight, but pretty good for the weight. If you really have yeah. to. If I really wanted to, yeah, I could wrestle 149, but wow. I think I'm a little bit too undersized. You know, I think I just, if I wanted to go 149, I'd have to get a little bit stronger Yeah, and, you know, put on some muscle, but I think 140 weight is going to be a perfect weight for me. You know, I, I'll be, I think I'll be a pretty big, not height wise, but thickness wise, I'll be a pretty good size 141 pounder and 
that's such a fun weight too that that's like one of the premier weight classes i mean that's such a good good weight yeah i'm excited for it and it's gonna be a lot of fun to compete in that weight class i can't wait man i'm so excited we got to have you on the show and uh been a fan of yours for like probably like you know five ten years from afar just watching learning and great to see you back in the mix man thanks again for coming on the show yeah thanks for having me on i appreciate it and that's the end of this episode of wrestling changed my life thank you to our sponsor spartan combat and coming monday august 30th we will be releasing our next audio documentary series it's called slaying satiev it's a story about the biggest upset in wrestling history that took place at the 2000 olympics We put a ton of time into these audio docs, so it would mean the world to me if you would check out Slang Sativ on Monday, August 30th, right here on this platform. Peace!